Welcome to worship with Millage Avenue Baptist Church. This morning we continue our Interabang series. An Interabang is a little known punctuation that is both an exclamation and a question. It's often used to express strong emotions that normal punctuations don't quite capture, like surprise, shock, extreme joy. Over these weeks, we're exploring some of the statements that Jesus' followers might have made in the days after his death and resurrection. These are also statements that we might make today as we wrestle to make meaning of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection in our own lives, especially in these COVID-19 pandemic moments. As a part of worship today, we will also have communion or the Lord's Supper. There's nothing quite like the smell of fresh baked bread. I wish you were here this morning to enjoy this with me. I hope that you've gathered bread of your choice and a beverage to participate in communion as a part of our service in a few moments. Let's begin our service with prayer. God, we acknowledge your presence among us this morning, even as we are your scattered church. As we gather in spirit for this hour, may we experience your presence in our worship. Sit with us, walk with us as we pray, sing, and give attention to your holy scriptures. In the ever-present name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. praises God, giving thanks for recovery from distress and illness, a reading from Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of shoal laid hold on me, 
I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant, I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since all these things took place. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and then he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road? while he was opening the scriptures to us. That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Good morning, boys and girls. Do you ever think about certain people with certain foods? Maybe you smell chocolate chip cookies and it reminds you of going to your grandparents' house. Or maybe you smell barbecue on the grill and it makes you think of your parents cooking out. We all have associations with certain foods. And for me, I've always associated lasagna with my brother Jed. He's a lot older than I am, and he went off to college when I was just about your age, in fourth grade. And whenever he came home for a visit, my mom would always cook lasagna, because that was his favorite. Well, one time around my high school graduation, um, I smelled lasagna cooking. And my brother, I was told, was not going to be able to come for my graduation, and I was sad about that. But I smelled lasagna, and immediately I thought of him. And so I asked my mom, is Jed coming home? And right as I walked in the kitchen to ask her, there he was. He had surprised me for graduation and cooking lasagna for him almost gave it away. Well, in our Bible story today, 
there are some disciples walking down the road and they meet a man. And then later they take this man into their home and as they're eating together, they recognize the man because he breaks the bread and he pours the cup and immediately they know that it's Jesus. The communion, the Lord's Supper, as we call it, reminded them and showed them who this man really was. So we learn from this story that Jesus must have looked a lot different after his resurrection. But he still took the time to be with his disciples, walking with them, talking with them, and even eating a meal with them together. And it was in that meal that they knew it was Jesus. And as soon as they realized it, it was like he disappeared because his job had been done. They knew he was there. He had risen from the dead and he loved them so very much. And we know the same things are true today. Our Lord is risen from the dead. Our Lord does love us so very much. And whenever we take communion in whatever form, it reminds us of Jesus and what he did for us just as the lasagna reminds me of my brother. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for the gift of food and how food and smells bring to mind memories and people that we love. Thank you, God, for sending your son Jesus for what he did for us on the cross and in rising from the dead and for the ways we remember him each time we take the Lord's Supper. Thank you for his love and care that we know continues now and will forever. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we pray today that you will be with scientists across our world who are working on vaccines. We pray for healthcare workers who put their lives on the line every day. We pray for all the first responders who continue to respond. We pray for the sick, heal them. We pray for the most vulnerable, protect them. 
We pray for our children, that they have the future they deserve. We pray for our leaders, give them the wisdom to guide us. We pray for our church, that it grows and honors you. Lord, I pray for each one of us that we find peace in your words and promises. Please take this offering and use it for your will. Amen. Have you ever been walking along and suddenly an amazing smell hits you and you are instantly taken back to a specific place in time? Memories flood your mind, joy fills your chest. Or maybe you were at a meal with friends, sitting around laughing and the food comes and you take a bite of a particular dish and the same thing happens. You're transported back to a specific place in time and situation, maybe that you hadn't th thought of in a long, long time. Smells and tastes have the ability to do that. Fresh baked bread does that for me just about every time. In college, I was an art major. I spent a lot of time in the fine arts building uh, between the different studios there particularly spent most of my time in the pottery or ceramics studio. I remember one spring day, my friend Hadi and I were up in the studio firing a kiln. Kilns took hours and hours and hours to fire and we were trying to get some specific techniques to get the kiln up to a certain temperature and so we were spending the entire day and most of the night there nursing that kiln and making sure we were able to get the effects we wanted.
The studio phone rang. This was back in the day when phones were on the wall and had a cord. We quickly went and answered it, and it was my mom. And mom said, son, meet me downstairs in 10 minutes. I have something for you. I didn't ask any questions. I, I went downstairs and met her in the small parking lot, and she handed me a paper bag, and in that bag was a still warm, fresh out of the oven loaf of homemade bread, a jar of honey, and a stick of butter. I took those things up to the studio, called Hottie, and we went out on the rooftop and overlooking campus. We devoured that entire loaf of bread and most of the butter and the honey. It was a memory I will never forget. And every time I get a whiff of fresh baking bread, I'm taken back to that moment, to that afternoon, to that day. It was a special time for me. Tastes and smells have a way of taking us back to memories, of accessing points in our mind that we may not normally think about. They remind us of events that have impacts on our lives. Such seems to be the case for Cleopas and his traveling companion in our scripture narrative. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Our story today opens with two travelers leaving the Passover celebration in Jerusalem and making their way seven miles home to Emmaus. The week did not turn out the way any of them had thought it would. All good Jews traveled to Jerusalem if they were able for the celebration, and Cleopas and his traveling partner did the same. Apparently, they were companions of Jesus. They went into the city with a celebration and left in confusion and grief and misery. I have a few questions as I read the story again. Who were these travelers? We're only given the name of one. To me, that would seem to be an important part of the story from Luke's perspective. He is such a detailed kind of guy in most of his writings. But we're only given the name of Cleopas, not the other traveler. Cleopas only appears this one time in the Bible, though there is another name that appears a few times that is very similar. Clopas, without the E, appears in John's gospel in a name at the foot of the cross where Jesus was crucified. Mary, wife of Clopas, is mentioned. That's curious. In Orthodox traditions, it is assumed that this is the same person. In fact, it is assumed that this is a cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the wife of Cleopas who appears in Luke's story. In those same Orthodox traditions, it was not just two friends that were walking along. It was husband and wife, Cleopas and his wife, Mary. That's fascinating to me. And that gives a nuance to the story that I love, that this family traveled to the Passover together, these relatives of Jesus, they celebrated in the triumphal entry they grieved at the foot of the cross. And now they are walking home wondering what now. And in their grief, Jesus comes along beside them. Is it essential that it's a husband and wife? No, it's two travelers. But I love that aspect of the story, and I think that it builds some dynamics there. I do like the imagery that maybe Jesus hung out with this couple in their home at their dinner table. That's a really cool, comforting thought. The average human walks 3.1 miles per hour, Google search tells me. It's approximately seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. We don't know when Jesus joined the trek, nor do we know how far the travelers had walked before Jesus joined them. We don't know when they started walking. We don't know if they were power walking, as my wife Karen does, or just meandering, looking around as I am wont to do. But imagine if they were just walking at an average pace, wondering what was going on, debating back and forth what had happened during the week. 
probably took them two and a half to three hours to make that journey. We're told that when they arrived at Emmaus, it was almost evening. I imagine they had talked a lot with Jesus about all kinds of things that had happened in that week. Apparently, Jesus began the process of helping the two of them understand who he was, what his mission had been, and how, how, how he fit into a new understanding of what Messiah was to be. We know that the disciples never really understood what Jesus was trying to teach them when he was alive. And so it appears that he begins doing some more of that teaching, taking what he had taught them, opening the scriptures to them again, and revealing who he was, what his mission had been, what his death and resurrection means in light of those Old Testament passages. My guess is some of the passages he pulled out were not the typical messianic passages. As I mentioned last week, Jesus really didn't fit all of the roles of what the Jewish leaders were expecting the Messiah to be. He was not a king like David was. He was not uh, a powerful priest like Elijah was who could call down fires of heaven. He did not call up armies to come take over the Roman Empire like they were expecting the Messiah to do. He painted a new picture of what Messiah looks like. As he walked along with them, Jesus talked with the couple and gave them a new, new, new idea of what it would mean to establish a kingdom of this world in this world. Jesus reframed the Bible for them. He's still doing that today. As we walk with Jesus and, and, and pray and talk with God about things that are going on in our life, and as we pick up the word and read it, it is enlivened by the Spirit of God, and we begin to see things differently than we had seen them before. Passages that in the past we had just skimmed over all of a sudden are fresh and pregnant with meaning that speaks into our current day. Things that we always assumed we understood seem to either take on less meaning or new meaning to us in light of contemporary circumstances. I imagine Jesus was doing some of that same stuff with them as they walked along and then sat in their home before dinner as dinner was prepared, the smell of fresh bread filling the room. And then as they sat to eat together, when our travelers got to Emmaus, it was almost night. The two invited Jesus in with them, practicing great biblical hospitality, not wanting him to walk on and be in the dark and not have a place to stay. I imagine the bread was baked and they were sitting around the table. The many paintings that I've seen of this, it's dark in the house, the table lit by only a candle. And in the darkness, Jesus picks up the bread to bless it. One thing has always troubled me when reading about Jesus' resurrection narratives. Why didn't anyone recognize him? Have you ever noticed that? We have these folks that traveled with him, knew him intimately for three plus years, and they didn't recognize him after he had risen. Apparently, he looked quite a bit different than he did before. When I was a kid, I used to watch TV and superhero shows and wonder why no one recognized Superman when he was the mild-mannered reporter, Clark Kent. All he did was have on a pair of glasses and a suit. He still looked the same. Was it like that? Jesus had something about him that people didn't recognize? Or was something else going on? I would have thought that there was some indication to folks of who he was. While it confounds me practically, theologically, I kind of like the idea. Jesus doesn't always look like we expect him to look. Doesn't always show up where we expect him to be. Doesn't always say what we expect him to say. 
Even today, Jesus appears in many different ways, in many different forms, in many different guises. We recognize Jesus not by what he looks like physically, but by the things he says and does. Jesus did say, my sheep know my voice, not my looks. Note that in all of the resurrection stories and Jesus' appearances are to diverse groups. That's kind of cool too. He doesn't just show up to the 12 disciples. He appears to other people. For me, that demonstrates that Jesus was concerned about everyone and wanted everyone to know he was still around more than just the disciples. After his resurrection, he was just as concerned with the least of these as he was with the 12 insiders. Scriptures tell us that he made lots of appearances in addition to those that are demonstrated in the Gospels and in Acts. I love that his appearance might have been to a married couple in this story. Or even to two single dudes who were living together that are normal, everyday folks Weary-worn travelers who are worried about the craziness of life, who are trying to figure things out after a nutsy week, and they come along and meet Jesus in the midst of that. In the post-resurrection stories, we, we glean that Jesus was still concerned with all aspects of life. Jesus comes alongside people who are in the midst of normalcy and dines with them, and visits them, comes into where they are. That's a cool aspect as well. Jesus is always with us, not just when we come to church, but always with us at home, at the table, as we walk, walk along the road, along the streets, as we go about life, as we go about business. Jesus is always with us. Jesus also shows us that, that we can interact with others who are hurting in some unique ways just by walking with them, just by sitting with them, just by showing up to where they are in the midst of their pain and grief. We can bring a casserole, yes, or we can invite them into us to be with us in the midst of their sadness and grief. We can share a meal with them, not for any other reason but to be with them, to calm their fears, to ease their anxiety, and to be a loving presence as Jesus was, to be where they are in their pain and grief. Though they had walked with him for miles and miles talking about scripture, prophecies, and other matters of theology, these two disciples only recognized Jesus when they sat at the table and broke bread with him. That's profound to me. It's not in the talk along the way. It's not in the sermon or the Bible study, if you will, that they recognize Jesus. It was in sitting at the table with him over a meal. How often do we, as professional Christians and congregations, get it wrong? How often do we think it's the sermon, it's the Bible study, it's, it's the evangelistic technique that offers life change to people. Didn't Jesus say, you will know you are my followers? They will know you are my followers by the way that you love each other, not the way you preach to each other, not the way you explain theology to each other, the way that you love each other. My dad was a campus minister yeah, I'm in the family business. Whenever we would have alumni from his past ministries come back through town or we would meet them somewhere, they rarely ever talked about the sermons that dad preached. They rarely ever talked about the Bible studies that he led. They rarely ever talked about the counseling experiences in his office. What they often talked about, however, or the times when they would come to our home and have dinner with us. And we would sit around afterwards for hours and hours talking about life, catching up, 
hearing what God was doing in their lives, hearing what they were struggling with, interacting one-on-one and with our family. There were times we would get in trouble as kids because we interrupted. There were times when we would have to get up and complain because we didn't want to help clean up the dishes. But we did. It was normal family life. And it was in those moments that seemed to have the most impact on dad's students. Perhaps instead of a cross, Our emblem of faith should be a towel in a basin or a plate in a cup or maybe a table set for a family dinner or perhaps just a loaf of fresh bread. Perhaps this time of year we should focus more on the meals that bookend Easter, the dinner at Bethany with Lazarus and Mary and Martha before they left to go to Jerusalem. Passover meal, the one that we call the Last Supper, or the two meals in our story today where they sat down at a table together after traveling that day in Emmaus, and then they shared the meal afterwards in Jerusalem with all the disciples where Jesus ate a piece of fish. Apparently, Jesus enjoyed a good meal. We know from the many times in scriptures where he appears reclining at a table with friends or even sometimes with enemies. He goes to the home of folks who are not really the mainstay of society to eat with them, to dine with them. He was called a drunkard and a glutton. His first miracle was at a wedding party where he turned water into wine. He fed thousands on mountainsides. Jesus liked to eat. Jesus liked to celebrate. Jesus liked to experience community in a family kind of atmosphere. How does community and with other believers and participating in the rituals of the church, like communion, allow us to experience Jesus more closely? Or how does Communing together over a meal show us Jesus in ways that discussing theology does not. How can sharing a meal with old friends, new friends, neighbors, maybe even a stranger, communicate the gospel, communicate God's love? We Baptists are great at taking casseroles to folks who are grieving or or who who are sick or have gone through some terrible experience. But what about inviting folks to the table with us in our homes? What about, what about learning to see that all of life, everyday life, even the act of sharing a meal together is a holy moment? Maybe we can learn to see those as times when Jesus is present with us in that community in ways that He cannot be when we're alone or isn't when we're alone or when we're studying scripture or even maybe when we're meeting here in the sanctuary. Maybe there is a deeper degree of fellowship with Jesus that we can find when we fellowship with each other around the table. Jesus' words and actions surely reminded Cleopas and his wife or fellow traveler, however you want to look at it, Surely they reminded them of the Last Supper that they celebrated with Jesus. It's narrated in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Familiar words to us. We aren't told what Jesus said when he sat at the table with Cleopas and the fellow traveler. We aren't told how he blessed the bread, what words he used. We aren't told anything other than than what's in the scripture. Was it just the repetition of words? Was it the way Jesus said it? Was it Was it just the fact that it was Jesus or somehow was there a miraculous unveiling of their eyes that occurred 
when Jesus prayed? We don't know. But we do know, the scriptures tell us, when he prayed, suddenly they realized who it was that they had spent the day with and that Jesus was alive and was with them. Their eyes were opened and they could see him. Tastes and smells have a way of taking us back to times and places of our past. I like to think for these two weary disciples traveling with Jesus, it was a bit of that going on as well. As they sat down for a simple evening meal of bread and wine, everything came rushing back. They had clarity of mind, heart, and spirit. They realized that Jesus was in their midst and had been all day. Jesus was still here. And they ran back to Jerusalem to tell their fellow disciples what they had experienced. One of the three ordinances that the church celebrates, that we as Baptists celebrate, is communion or the Eucharist, or as we like to call it, the Lord's Supper. Once a quarter, and sometimes on other special occasions, we reenact that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples with bread and wine or juice. I invite you now to share bread and wine with me, to reenact both the Last Supper and this meal shared together by Cleopas and the fellow traveler and Jesus. Pray with me. God, through the sharing of this bread and wine, may we participate in your resurrection story. May we acknowledge your presence with us today and every day. May we understand that the power and spirit that lived in Jesus also lives in us. Amen. We're told that that night that Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, This is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, This is my blood poured out for you. Drink it in remembrance of me. The scriptures tell us that it was only then, when Jesus had blessed and broken the bread, that the eyes of Cleopas and his companion were opened. And they recognized Jesus. They marveled to each other about the way that their heart had been warmed as they walked along. And then they jumped up and ran back seven miles to Jerusalem. To where the other disciples had been huddled together in their room. Talking as well about the events of the week. They told them about their experiences from the day and how Jesus had appeared to them. And what had happened when he had prayed and broken the bread. And then Jesus appeared in the room with all of them. And ate with them. And they shared a meal together. Huddled together in the mix of confusion and grief and unexpected joy. There they found Jesus. May such joy be found for us in these crazy days. As you are huddled in your home, alone maybe, or with family, know that you are not alone. Jesus is there with you. Just as Jesus understood his disciples' fear and concerns, he also understands yours. Just as Jesus met them where they were, walking along the road, huddled in that upper room, Jesus meets you where you are, in your home, in your place of work. Just as Jesus has invited them to participate in his suffering and in fear, he, he allowed them to touch him, to taste and see. 
he also invites us to do the same thing, to experience Jesus in every part of our lives. Will you do that today? Will you open yourselves up to the mystery of Christ's incarnation in your life and in your presence? Rest in him, in the knowledge that even when we don't feel it, God is with us. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge your presence with us now and always. We thank you for being with us, for loving us. We thank you for bread and wine that reveal your presence to us, that guide us to think about you in creative ways, to help us understand that your presence never leaves, that you are always available, that you are always comforting and empowering and guiding. God, we thank you for that knowledge. In the sweet name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now hear this word of benediction. May you this day taste and see that our Lord is good. May you be surprised by Jesus as you go through your day. May the presence of the risen Christ be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.